Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 19. 1 Chronicles chapter 19. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 19. Um, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and then 1 and 2 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 19. Uh, I appreciate Pastor allowing me to preach, and, and it's kind of a oxymoron when you say thank you for allowing me to preach because there's there's a part that says, oh man, it, it's like, it's it's and you guys that preach understand this, it's when you have your morning devotions, it, 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 you read the Bible, you learn something about God, learn something from God, and but when you're asked to preach, all of a sudden there's a certain soberness that comes over that's more than just de- devotions. It's like, it's like walking across a log and you're happily walking across and if all of a sudden it opened up and there's a 40 foot drop, all of a sudden you're a little more serious about your stability. And that's what I find preaching is. It's, it's not just, uh, I'll open the Bible and turn here, read here and we'll say, there, how, do you, how do you like that? That's this, we want, you didn't come here to waste your time and I didn't come to waste mine. Uh, all right, let's, uh, I'm going to read. If you follow along, I'm going to read the first three verses of uh, First Chronicles chapter 19, and re- verse 1, 2, and 3. It says there in verse 1, Now it came to pass after this that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died, and his son reigned in his stead. And David said, I will show kindness unto Hanun, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father, So the servants of David came into the land of the children of Ammon to Hanan to comfort him. But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Are not his servants come unto thee for to search and overthrow and to spy out the land? Uh, Let's have a word of prayer and we'll start. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity, Lord. I sure pray that... Uh, you direct what I say, Father, and uh, that, that this is glorifying to you, and it's not it's, uh, that I'm in spite of me, Lord. I pray that it will be, what would be said, uh, it, it'll please you. It'll help somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, oh, now, this is, th- what this is, is, is the beginning of an awful saga for this nation of Ammon. Ammon, it began with this incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter in a cave after God rained judgment down on uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah, and Ammon has always had always been uh, an enemy of the nation of Israel. If you remember over there in the book of Judges, uh, Jephthah, he, he was that man that, that the Israelites went and got and said, can you fight for us? It was the Ammonites he fought against. And um, this here, somewhere, we, we, we don't know where, but David had reached some kind of diplomacy with this nation of Ammon. It said there in verse number, uh, verse number uh, two, it says, and David said, I will show kindness on Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So somewhere in there, David and, and this king of Ammon, they got along fine. And, um, and so David hears that this man, Nahash, has died, so he sends some uh, messengers to just be kind to him, to condolences uh, and his father's death. Uh, and... Um, and, and these fellows, they, they convince this man, Hanan, to make a decision, and he does. And he loses his life, and he loses lives of his citizens, he loses the country, and everything was based on this foolish decision that he made. That was sad, sad thing. Um, I'd like to make a couple observations here before I start. First off, I want to say that uh, <clears throat> this, this David comes, and he, this overture of kindness that he shows up with, it's rejected by this man, Hanan. Uh, you know, that's not unlike the gospel that's rejected by a lost man. He's, God's trying to be kind to somebody. And he comes with the gospel and somebody says, no. And, and it's like when Jesus stood outside Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which I sent unto you. And, and, you know, he says, I would have taken you like a chicken or a hen with their chicks and gathered you under my wings. And then he said, the next time you see me, it'll be, be the one that you'll be saying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And he's talking about one day when that Antichrist, his armies are surrounding Jerusalem, those people will be saying, Praise God, the Lord's come to rescue us. And, and, and that's, you know something, that, take a look here in, in chapter 20. Go one chapter over. It says there in verse number 2, it says, um, And David took the crown of their king from off his head, this is Hanan's head, 
and found it to weigh a talent of gold, and there were precious stones in it, and was set upon David's head. And you know what that's like? That, that kind of reminds me of over there in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, that we won't turn to it, but the Bible says at the end of the tribulation, it says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. It's like the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, and he's now the king. And he's the king, and, uh, and he rules this earth. And you know, uh, that'll be a wonderful thing, but uh, I, I want you to know that, so this is, maybe you don't see that when you read the Bible, but I look at that and I think, well, that's something, all right, that's something, one day the Lord will come back. But um, the second observation is, uh, notice in First Chronicles chapter 19 and First Chronicles 20 is the victory that uh, uh, Nahash makes this poor decision. The, uh, the, the, he, he hires Syria, Syria helps Ammon, and both Syria and Ammon are whipped. David takes the crown, puts it on, and it's done. It's, it, it, Ammon's finished. Syria's finished. Uh, and yet, this is God's record of what took place. And yet, I want you to notice, hold on to First Chronicles 19. The same, the same events are mentioned back there in 2 Samuel. Take a look at 2 Samuel chapter number 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10. Uh, this, this just a couple observations before we start. Second Samuel, oh, Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter ten, and and just so you see, Second Samuel ten verse one, it says, and it came to pass after this, the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned instead. And David said, I will show kindness unto Hanan the son. So the same same events we just read in First Chronicles nineteen. Uh, now, now you've got to jump over to chapter 12 and look at uh, chapter 12 and verse number uh, uh, 26. Chapter 12, verse 26. It says, And Joab fought against Reba for the children of Ammon and took the royal city. And look there in verse number uh, 30. It says, And he, that's David, took their king's crown, that's Hanan's, from off his head. The weight thereof was a talent of gold with precious stones and was set on David's head. That's what we read in First Chronicles 19 and 20. But do you know what we're reading in 2 Samuel chapter 10? We had to jump to 2 Samuel chapter 12 to get the end of the story. In between there, there's this shameful event in David's life. Look at chapter 11, 2 Samuel 11, verse number 2. It says, And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off his bed, walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and that woman was very beautiful to look for. Do you know the, the actual events that took place during this, you can go back to First Chronicles 19. Uh, during this this time with Ammon uh, and 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 Hanun making this poor decision, David stepped out with Bathsheba, committed adultery, committed murder. But when we get the First Chronicles, there's no record of that. You know, you can observe from that that when you get saved, your sins are washed under the blood. They're gone. They're gone, they're gone, they're gone. And God doesn't see them anymore. And you know, in spite of the fact that you might have relatives, you might have carnal Christian friends, you might have yourself reminding you of things that you did wrong that are going to try to squash your zeal because of something you did back there, they're done. God doesn't see that. That's a wonderful thing to, uh, to notice here. And so uh, uh, that's a second observation. Um, the third one is, uh, 1 Chronicles 19 again, is that this, this man, he, uh, he makes him this disastrous decision, this Hanun, and it's during a very low time in his life. His father just died. <laughs> now, we don't know when David's messengers showed up if they came during the funeral, before the funeral, or after the funeral. But I'll guarantee you that this man was not thinking the same after his dad died than he was before. Because he's got this awful responsibility, he's got grief, he's got... And uh, this is not the time to make a decision, like he made a decision. And um, I read this book in the last, I don't know, a year or two. It was called An Autopsy of War. It was about this man who was a surgeon in the military. And, this, this, and, he, and the whole book was mainly... The man wrote it, when he, I'm guessing, when he was in his late 60s, 70s. And he was so torn up about his whole life and decisions that he'd made. And he was, now I know this is humanism playing a part, but he, he, he tried to justify some of the things he did do or didn't do because of decisions that his father did in his life. His father had been a, a pastor in a church. And his father, this, this man, his words, he said that his father's best friend was the undertaker, the funeral director. 
And what would happen, this, this man's father would, uh, his buddy at the funeral home would phone him up and say, yeah, I got another stiff here. I, I don't know how they were that, but that, so the, the, the pastor would say, good. So it would be, he'd always get, get guys that just died, and this pastor, very unscrupulous, very wicked, he'd take advantage of the widow who was just vulnerable and unstable, emotionally upside down. And, and this, this whole book was about how th that man affected how... It, and he's seen the hypocrisy in all this. And, and I'm saying to you that this, this man, Hanun, was the same thing. His father just died. Somebody comes to him and somebody says, hey, don't trust those guys. And he makes it, that's the wrong time to make a decision. So just what kind of practically, I guess, the observation, not the message, is that, uh, you know, between now and time, Lord comes by, back, you're, you're, we're going to lose people close to us. We're going to go to heaven. You're saved. You're going. And, and when that happens, you better be a little slow about signing the dotted line, whether it's life insurance, whether it's the funeral director, whether it's your relatives that show up out of nowhere that are real desperate and need a money, whatever it is, just be careful, because that's going to be a time when you're going to be vulnerable. And uh, this man, he, he made this decision, and it, wasn't, uh, it, it was not a good decision. Um, you know, when, when Jacob showed up to Esau, he did not wait until Esau was wiping the gravy and the ketchup off his mouth with the back of his sleeve, and then say, hey, you want to sell the birthright? He waited till uh, Esau was going, what good's the birthright to me? I'm at the point of death. You see that? When Jesus was tempted by the devil... The devil didn't wait till Jesus just finished, pushed away from the table at Mary and Martha's place. He waited till he was 40 days fasting, and then he said, hey, how about turning those stones into bread? Because he knew, I'm just trying to help you, the observation of this little story here. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> oh, another lesson about uh, uh, this man making a decision. Uh, don't be too hasty. Don't, don't be too hasty in making a decision. Uh, you know, as much as we, you know, that the Rehoboam, the, the son of Solomon, made a disastrous decision that split the kingdom, you've got to admit that the guy did say, hey, come back in three days and I'll let you know what my decision is. This man here, look, what he, look at the end of verse, uh, in the middle of verse number three, uh, 1 Chronicles 19.3, that these men say, are not his servants come unto thee for to search and overthrow and spy out the land? Verse four, wherefore Hanan took David's servants, shaved them, cut off their garments, mid hard by the buttocks, and sent them away. There is no gap in there. Just, is that what's happening? Okay, here, do this. He, he, at the very least, he could have said, now just hold on, fellas. Let's, let's look this over. So don't be hasty in your decision making. Okay, with that said, I'd like to preach a message called, To Whom Are You Listening? And because the sound guys always say, what was the name of your message? To whom are you listening? Okay. Um, uh, now, now, believers, like everybody else, there's always somebody vying to try to get you. There's voices that are trying to get you, attempting to guide and influence and direct our lives. And it, it's all over. We're constantly being bombarded. Why don't you do this? Have you ever considered doing that? And, it, and, and so I want to preach a message of, uh, to whom are you listening. Um, in the 1970s, if the Russians wanted to invade Canada... And at that time, Justin Trudeau's father was running it, so he would have gladly gave it to them. But if he didn't, if they wanted to invade, they could have easily. You know what? They, considering, on one condition, they came on Saturday night between 7 and 9. Brother Jane, why would that be? Because hockey night in Canada was on between. And most of the country was watching. I'm serious. And who were the two teams that were always there? Toronto and Montreal? I didn't ask before. That's just, if you're over 50 or 60, uh, that's just the, the, the culture of our country. Toronto or Montreal were the only two teams that were always on the one channel, and they played a handful of other teams, and that was just, uh, that was it. And most of Canada was sitting in their living room watching. And so you either cheered for Montreal or Toronto. And Brother Lowen and I were out door knocking. There was this older guy, young guy, my age. He, was, uh, he had a big sign out front that said, Toronto Maple Leafs. And just after Brother Lowen finished talking to him, I said, uh, <laughs> this is way off subject from what you guys were just talking about. But did you grow up watching Tr uh, Hockey Night in Canada? He said, yeah, man, we had a TV this big, and you turned it on, and I had to wait for a while before it slowly came on with black and white, and it was either Toronto or Montreal, and I chose Toronto. And that's <laughs> just the way it is. But you know something? You had two teams, you had one channel, and you had a whole nation, and that was it. You know what? After a while, they got more and more teams. Whoever won the Stanley Cup, I have no idea who they were. I know it wasn't Toronto or Montreal, because I would kind of lean towards. But there are all these teams. And then you got more channels. And then you got sports channels. And then you got internet. 
And now you've got all these sports and all these teams, and, all, and it's no longer just a choice of two. You know that's the way it is with believers? You got, if you want to believe something about anything, go on the Internet and you'll find somebody to back up your belief. You better be careful who you're listening to. And, uh, and so to whom are you listening to? I'll show you how close it is. You need First Chronicles, but go over there to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter number 9. There's voices that are constantly Psalms, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 9. Look here at the, uh, I don't want to call it a sales pitch, but the, the alluring voice of someone trying to get your my attention. Look at verse number 1, Proverbs 9, verse 1. The Bible says, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath you know her seven pillars. This is good. This is God's wisdom. Verse number 3, She, this is God's wisdom, hath sent forth her maiden. She crieth unto the highest places of the city. L listen to the allurement, the, the listen to me uh, voice coming through in verse number 4. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, and then she goes on and says, but that verse, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she said, that, that. now look down there in verse number 13. Totally the opposite. This is another voice. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. She, for she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high place of the city to call passengers to go right on their ways. Verse 16 is almost word for word with verse 4. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. Do you, do you see that? The, there, there's a voice over here saying, listen to me. And there's one over here saying, listen to me. And the question comes down to whom are you going to listen to? That's, that's, that's the question. Um, you know, uh, Sarah, she, she told Abraham, she said, listen, you want an heir, you and I are getting up in age, we're not going to have one. Why don't you have one through Hagar, the handmaid? He listened. He shouldn't have listened. Jesus told, or God told Adam and, Adam and Eve, don't touch that tree of the knowledge, good and evil. They should have listened. They didn't listen. They come, who are you going to listen to? Um, John and Ab, that little weasel friend of Am, Ammon, who would have been the next king in the nation of Israel following his father David, he advised Ammon how to take advantage of his half-sister. Ammon listened. He shouldn't have listened. And, 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 I, and I'm saying to you that you and I are constantly getting voices and suggestions and advice and counsel to go one way or another. And, and I'm just, I want to help you here how to, how to decide who you're going to listen to. That old prophet, uh, he comes out, the young prophet who cursed that altar of Jeroboam in Bethel, and he says, come on over to my house and eat here. And the young man says, no, I'm not supposed to. No, no, I'm a prophet too, and God told me. And he listened. He shouldn't have listened. And uh, first thing I want to say, before you make a decision as to whether you listen or not, you're going to hear some counsel, some advice, some, some words coming your way. You need to look at the source. You need to look at the source. Um, you look, at the, look at the motive David had for sin. This is David. This is a man after God's own heart. This is a man that, uh, that loved God. And look at the, the motive in verse number two. David said, I will show kindness on Hanun. Because his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his uh, father. Uh, so the servants of David came into the land of the children of Ram and Hanan to comfort him. Notice there's kindness and there's comfort. You know the Bible says about the Bible that the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we should pay, through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have. You know this Bible is a comfort. If, if the source of the, the, the voice that comes to you comes out of this book. You can count on it. You can make a decision on that. Um, the Bible says there in Titus 3, 4, that, but after that the kindness, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I, I, the, the, when, when, when God sent Jesus down to die for our sins, that was kindness. And I, I don't think we always appreciate that kindness. David sent these men for kindness and for comfort. And this man, Hanun, did not look at the source. He just listened to a voice, and he said, I think I'll make this decision. He should have looked at, looked at the source. Should have looked at the source. Um, you know, this is equivalent to a man who hears the gospel. And if he's Hanun, and he's listening to the wrong voices, a voice is going to say, you know, this is just a religious pitch. You know what they're after. They're after your money. You understand that. that you're listening to the wrong source. This is after the guy that's sitting in the church, and the, somebody makes an announcement and says, now listen, brother so-and-so is coming through, and, uh, and you know, you ought to pray what we ought to do to help this man. To, you know, he's going to need uh, gas in his vehicle and, and might want to put him up and might want to help him down the road and might consider taking him on. You know what the voice whispering to you is going to be, one of them? He's just after your pocketbook. He's just after your wallet. 
you better be careful. You better be careful. The, the, the man that's sitting, that, that's maybe eyeing some lost woman, and, and she's flashing the eye and showing the leg and all the rest of that stuff, and that guy's thinking, hmm, and he's giving it some thought, and that preacher somewhere in there mentioned something about being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do you know what the boy mentioning hun is going to be? It's going to be, he's just trying to ruin your fun. He's just trying to run your life. Just trying to run your life. You better be careful. You better be careful what voice you're listening to. Um, uh, that Paul, after reaming out those, those Corinthian believers in First Corinthians chapter, uh, for, in the book of First Corinthians, for 12 chapters, uh, kicking their problems and straightening them out and uh, laying things on the line and shooting. Uh, by the time he was done, you know in, for, in Second Corinthians he wrote that letter, you know what he said his motive was? He said this, he said by pureness, by knowledge, by long, long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. He said, you know what, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to be kind to you. I'm trying to, comfort, I'm trying to keep you from making errors down the road. This fellow here, he looked and he just went, what do you think I'd do? Yeah, you're right, they're up to no good. Be careful. To whom are you listening to? To whom are you listening to? Um, you know, uh, the second, so the first thing, you ought to be, uh, you, ought to, you need to look at the source, the source. Next thing you ought to do is you ought to consider the cost, consider the consequences. Now, um, we're done with First Chronicles 19, but if you take a look over there at 2 Samuel chapter 8, 2 Samuel chapter 8, again, this, this, is, this is kind of about, the, about David's conquest, and 2 Samuel chapter 8, the whole chapter is filled with... Uh, it's, it's filled with military victories and accomplishments that David and Israel made. And there were some other nations, 2 Samuel chapter 8, there were some other nations that were, uh, they were subservient to uh, Israel. They provided, uh, they provided silver, they provided gold, brass, and, and uh, they sent them to David, and David used that to <clears throat> please God with. Uh, take a look there in um, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 10. It says about a, a king of another nation. 2 Samuel 8, verse 10, it says, Then Toy sent Joram his son unto King David to salute him and to bless him, because he had fought against Hadadezer and smitten him. For Hadadezer had wars with Toy, and Joram brought with him vessels of silver, vessels of gold, and vessels of brass. So he's bringing this from this other nation to give to David. Verse 11, <clears throat> Which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and the gold, which he had dedicated of all the nations which he had subdued. So he put some nations down, and those nations, in turn, provided him with gold and silver and brass. And look at the list of nations that David subdued. Verse 12, of Syria, there's a nation, and of Moab, there's a nation, and of the children of Ammon. Do you, do you understand that for Hanun to think, David's not telling us what to do. If he's up to no good, like you fellows are telling me, then we're going to get Syria together and we're going to... Hey, Hanun, you're already under David. He's already conquered you. This is utter lunacy to think that you can now go against David and say, he, he, you're already providing him with, with goods. You follow what I just said? The Bible says there that David subdued the children of Ammon. They're already down here. And for this man to think that I'm going to go marching up to David and tell him, don't you dare spy out the country. You're already under him. Um, uh, what did he think would happen? Syria that he hired, uh, that Hanun hired to help him was also already under David. It was a recipe for disaster. And I don't go off the subject here, but uh, if you check out history, this is, uh, you can take what you want and run with it wherever you go, but, but uh, th this is history. Do you know there are countries in Europe, there's France, there's England, Germany, Holland, Belgium, uh, those countries at one time uh, had several countries around the globe that were subservient to them. I mean, you call them colonies, call them what you want. And those nations, over a matter of time, and one by one, they either were given their independence or they said, take your shackles off us because we are no longer, and they demanded their, and they fought for their independence. Uh, do you know, by and large, most of those nations, if you look at them today, They've been ravaged with civil war, with famine, with disease, with crime. And the thing is, they turn to the rest of the world and say, hey, help us. <laughs> um, you know, with independence comes responsibility. <laughs> That's just part of life. Uh, the Americans were, the, were the, uh, the exception to that rule. The Americans uh, in July 4th, 1776, they tore off the shackles of England and said, we're independent. You know, they fared well. They did well. You say, why? Because they took the morals and the principles of this book 
And they said, we're going to run with this. Do you know why they're going down now? They're running with the authors, uh, uh, Karl Marx and Charles Darwin. And they decided, I think we'll chuck that and go that way. That's why you've seen that. But nonetheless, this man here, he had it pretty good. David's trying to be kind to him. And he listens to some voices that says, no, don't listen. They're up to no good. Um, you know, he didn't count the uh, cost. He didn't look at the consequences. If you're married and a voice says or a thought says, boy, she is so... Before you go any further, you ought to consider, how's my marriage going to turn out? How's my conscience going to be? How's my testimony going to be? What's going to happen to the children? You ought to consider those things. Do you, you understand when the voice comes in, you ought to be considering those things? You've got a job where you can be in church. It pays the bills. You don't have to be lo gone long periods of time for your home and family. And the voice says, listen, man, you can make so much more money if you, well, if you counted the cost, if you considered how long you're going to be gone. Is it going to be hard on the family? Yeah, you might make the money, but now you're in bigger income tax. You're going to need a better vehicle. You're going to have, um, before you make a, a decision based on whatever you hear, you ought to consider, who am I listening to? Consider the source. Consider the... Uh, uh, the consequences after you make that decision. That man, Hanun, did not consider those. Okay, now, uh, um, we're, we're done with Hanun. That was one, one little um, incident that took place. Now I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter 40. Jeremiah chapter 40 is a totally different man, but same principles apply, and see uh, uh, how this thing turns out. Again, to whom are you listening? In Jeremiah chapter 40, the Babylonians have invaded Judah. The king's dead. Most of the Jews are either dead or they've been taken prisoner up to Babylon. There's a small group of people that are still remaining in Judah. Uh, for, for over 100 years, the northern part of Judah, the ten tribes have, were invaded by Assyria. They're out of the picture. This is now Judah, the south. And, uh, and they've been conquered by Babylon. The, 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 of this remnant, there's one man who's been put in charge. He's the governor of this small group of Jews that are still remaining in the land. His name is Gedaliah. He's been appointed governor by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. The Jewish people that, that, that haven't been taking up, taken up north to Babylon, they look at Gedaliah, and they look at this small group of Jews, and they look at all the upheaval and everything that's gone crazy in the last few years, and they're, they're, they're thinking to myself, this man, we can find stability, we can find hope, we can find some type of purpose for living here because this man is here and he is a great man, the only man that's left that's a Jew, and he's in charge. Take a look there. In, uh, as a matter of fact, it's so, so influential, this man, Gedaliah, that there's people coming from other countries from whence they've fled from the war, and they're coming back to Judah because they heard Gedaliah's here. There's a remnant still there. They're coming back. Take a look there in verse number uh, verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 6. They also had the man of God there. Look at the, verse 6. Then went Jeremiah on to Gedaliah, that's the man, the son of Akim, to Mitzvah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. Now look at the, 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 the uh, caliber of the people that showed up. Verse 7. Now when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, even they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Akim governor in the land, and committed unto him men and women and children, and of the poor and of the land, and of them that were not carried away to capital, uh, captive to Babylon, then, came, then they came to Gedaliah to Mitzvah. Uh, take a look there for, uh, down furthermore to verse number 11. Verse 11, it says, Likewise, when all the Jews that were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom, that when all the countries heard that the king of Babylon left the remnant of Judah and that he set over them Gedaliah, the son of Kim, son of Japhim, even all the Jews returned out of all the places whither they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah unto Mitzvah and gathered, much, uh, gathered wine and summer fruits very much. Do you see that this, this is... Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can read David's accounts of his mighty men back there in 2 Samuel, and, and there is verse after verse, mighty men, and all their exploits, and it, boy, that's something. You know, Jeremiah 40, it's pickings is pretty slim. Not a, lot of, not a lot of mighty men around, not a lot of anything good, but there is Gedaliah, and there's a remnant, and there's some hope, and there's a possibility we might have some stability after all that's taken place here. Um, 
Now, look at verse number 13. Here's, verse, here's some, the, one of the good men. Moreover, Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains, these are good men, of the forces that were in the fields, came to Gedaliah at the Mitzvah, and said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? They, they said, Listen, man, do you understand what's coming down the pipe here, Gedaliah? We're, if, if something happens to you, we're in trouble. And we're trying to... Now, do you understand over here you had some people coming that meant something for good? Some people advise this man, hey, they're up to no good. Over here, you have a man coming with no good. Some people come into this man and they're saying, listen, you better be careful. And they're telling the truth. You better be careful. This man does not have your best interest at heart. Look what Gedaliah says to them. Uh, at the end of verse number 14. But Gedaliah, the son of Akim, believed them not. You know what he said? Now listen. You guys are a little bit too far into the conspiracy theory. You guys are a little too far into listening to those independent news outlets. You guys are always listening. You always got the negative take on things, you know. We, we, we don't need that stuff here. What we need is more positive approach. Just don't look at the bad side of things. You really don't expect that guy to be. He does not have evil intentions. You're just trying to stir up the waters. No need for that. Okay, so Johanan takes it one step further. Look, look what Johanan says. Verse 15. Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spoke to Gedaliah and Mitzvah secretly, saying, Let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nathaniel, and no man shall know it. Whereof shall he slay thee? Now look what he says. He says, This is the result if you don't kill that man, or if I don't kill him, Gedaliah. Look at the end of verse 15 that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered and the remnant of Judah perish. He said, listen, over here, this man Hanun, these guys said, no, 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 they're up to no good. They didn't say, if you, if you uh, harm these men and attack Israel, you're going to ruin, ruin the whole works. But you know what happened this man? He fortunately had some good people come to him and say, listen, if you don't make this decision... I'll do it for you. And we won't even tell anybody you didn't have the guts to do it. I'll do it because if you die, Gedaliah, we're done. We're finished. Gedaliah's answered. Verse 16. But Gedaliah, the son of Achim, said unto Johanan, the son of Korea, thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. <laughs> um, I, I, the question is, whom are you listening to? You make decisions based on information you get. Here's a man that was given the wrong information and he acted wrongly and he hurt somebody or tried to hurt somebody that was trying to do good for him. Here's a man who was given sound counsel about some evil coming his way and he wouldn't listen. Uh, whom are you listening to? Um, you say, well, uh, uh, this man, Gedaliah, said, you speak falsely. Well, let, let's see what happened. Let's see what the results were. Verse four, chapter 41, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, that's the man, that's the assassin, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishma, the seed royal and prince of the king, even ten men with them, came to Gedaliah, the son of Kim, to Mitzpah, where they did eat bread together. And I'm sure Gedaliah is thinking, see, all that nonsensical talk about, you know, uh, conspiracy theories and all the negative talk, they're just nonsense. Verse 2, then arose Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, they killed him the son of Kim, the son of Shaphan with the sword, and slew him. Verse number 3, Ishmael also threw, slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mitzvah, and the Chaldeans were found there in the men of war. Do you understand when this Johanan man, and these captains came and said, you better be careful, they knew what they're talking about. They're, which incidentally, over here, you had some princes advising Hanan. What's, what's the physical family relationship of a prince to a king. Uh, prince Charles is now the king. His mother was his, uh, his, his, he was his son's mother. These men were princes. That would indicate they were his sons. That were, would indicate that they were younger men telling this man, David's men are up to no good. Kind of like Rehoboam didn't listen to the older men, but he listened to the young men. This man here, there's no indication, these were, there's an indicator, these were captains. These weren't just nominal men that were rank and file. These men knew whereof they spoke. And they said, listen, buddy, you better be careful. This fellow didn't listen to them. He should have listened. I said, whom you, to whom are you listening to? Um, 
You say, well, what's the results? Well, take a look there in, in Jeremiah chapter 43. Jeremiah 43. And, and look what happened because of the, this man, Gedaliah, did not listen to the right voices. Verse number, chapter 43, verse number 4. So Johanan, the son of Korea, this is now the man that advised to kill Ishmael, and all the captains, they also advised to kill him, and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. It, do, you, do you see, not only was Gedaliah killed, but these people who were counting on Gedaliah to lead them, when he died, they fell. They were no longer following God. They, they, they'd gone to Jeremiah and said, ah, should we go to Egypt? And Jeremiah came back and said, don't. And they said, we're not listening to you. Had Gedaliah not uh, listened to their, had he listened to their advice and killed Ishmael, they wouldn't have been in that situation. Look at verse number seven, Jeremiah 43, verse seven. It says, uh, or sorry, back there in verse six. It says, even men, women, and children, and the king's daughters, and every person that Nebuzan, the captain of the guard, left Gedaliah, the son of Akim, son of uh, Shaphan, and Jeremiah, the prophet, and Barak, the son of Nerah, so they came into the land of Egypt. <laughs> you talk about out of the frying pan into the fire. These people, because one man did not listen. I ask again, who are you listening to? This man, Gedaliah? His name should have been Get Along. He just, he just didn't want didn't to muddy the waters. He just thought everything would go good. You know what his problem was? Uh, he never had a negative attitude toward the world. He thought, it'll be okay. It's, no, no, you guys, you don't, don't look at it from a negative aspect. And um, in defense of this man over here, this man wasn't told that, that David's men were sincerely trying to help. We read that. But verbally, he wasn't told. This man, he was told, listen, he's got your worst intentions at heart. He didn't listen. Um, you know, in years gone by, you could find some principles of the Bible still being preached on in most evangelical churches. You could find the gospel clearly being presented in most evangelical churches. You could find sin being preached against. You know, it ain't so anymore. Like Brother Lowen mentioned about that man that came, or a couple came from a church, they never heard the gospel. Uh, you have a smaller group of people now that still believe this book, and you make a decision to go the wrong way, it's, you're going to hurt more than just yourself, like this man did. If you let your guard down against this world, it, it, it'll get you, it'll get your thinking, it'll get your fashion, your habits, your family, and when you go down, a lot of people who looked up to you for stability, they're going to fall too, because they thought, this man, this woman, you could always count on them, and now what happened? I'm telling you to whom are you listen to, to whom are you, I'm asking you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples and then I'm finished. Uh, we rightly believe in men dressing like men, women dressing like women, and it's, you know, it's appalling to see all these losers, that, you know, these guys, they, they, they pretend they're women so they could participate in women's sports because they couldn't make it in men's. And do you know how we got there, <laughs> how it became acceptable in our society? Uh, when a man has long hair, uh, if a man has style, a hairstyle like a woman, he's got a man bun. Somebody said, you got a man bun, turn in your man card. You're not a man. Uh, but you, the, the, if you got jewelry like a woman, clothing like a woman, do you know the, the reason that's, be, that's become acceptable in our society is because there are a bunch of get-a-liars that thought, it won't get any worse. It'll, it'll stop right there. It didn't stop. It kept going and going. Uh, years ago, I worked with a man. His name was Abe Swatsky. He was, a, he was an owner-operator. I was owner-operator. We worked at this company. And his wife was a secretary in this company. And the company had 80, 90 trucks or so. And, uh, and the, 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 the woman was telling me, this guy's wife, she said, I went into Ward's office. Ward was the big boss of the place. She said, uh, I, I, I went to his office and I said, when did your sister, this would have been 1992, 1993. She said, Ward, when did your sister start working here? And, uh, and he said, I don't have a sister. What are you talking about? He said, no. She said, I, I, I saw your sister, a little ponytail. And he had a brother that worked, <laughs> worked for the company. And his brother had hair about down to here. And he thought it'd be cute. So he put a ponytail there. And this woman made a mockery of that. Do you know the next day the brother showed up? No ponytail. <laughs> you say, why? She wasn't a good liar. She wasn't a good along. And, and thank God for people like that. Um, uh, you know, uh, they're back in the 60s and 70s, when sitcoms, that's uh, things on TV, when they showed up, the women wore this style. <laughs> I've, I've got to say this because it just, it's got to be said. 
The, the women in those sitcoms, and you say, what sitcoms? Gilligan's Island. I know nobody here has watched TV. But you might have heard of these programs. Gilligan's Island, um, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, Dick Van Dyke. You know what the women, I think, they, I think that they thought it would be re too repulsive to your average man at the time, so they wouldn't have them wear mini skirts. You know what they did? They wore feminine pants. Those feminine pants were like this. Tight at the ankle, they showed, uh, they showed off their ankle. I'll give you one guess which gender thinks that's cool today. You say, what happened? Some get a lie, I thought. It's okay. Not a big deal. No, no. Just, hey, man, you better have a negative attitude towards that world because it will not stop. It'll keep coming and coming and coming. And before long, you're going to look along, around and say, what happened, man? I'll tell you what, get a lie. You didn't, take, you didn't listen to the voice that said, you better kill him. I'm not saying kill your kids. Or kill your, but you better, you, better, you better stop the thing before it takes over. And uh, I had this, I'm finished, just, um, so, so you're not on spiritual, you close by. Uh, last week, I was going to be gone, and this fellow, a good man, I work with this guy, he's Ukrainian, doesn't speak good English, and he wanted to uh, do something on his vehicle. And my boss said, I'd like to have him over to my place, but I live 30 miles away, and I said, that's okay, I'll have him over to my, he's a good man. So I handed him the keys, and I said, listen, uh, here's the keys, uh, this one's for the house, that's for the garage, that's for the tools, I'll do whatever, I'm going to be gone for a day and a half, be back Saturday afternoon. He was so happy. I come back next afternoon, and, uh, and he was just about finished. He was so thankful, so appreciative. And, uh, and he pulls out his wallet, and I said, no, no, I, forget that. I don't, don't worry about it. And he, he was just happy. You know, a couple days later, I came home, and there on my porch was a brand new bottle of wine sitting there. And, you know, as soon as I thought that, as soon as I saw it, I knew right off where it came from. And the other thing, as soon as I saw that, I thought, I got a decision to make. I could either say nothing, which would then give him grounds to think, I guess he thinks it's okay. Or I could approach him and say, listen, I, I'm a Christian, I don't drink. You know, I opted for plan B. I told him, I said, you know, I appreciate your appreciation, but I don't drink. And he said, oh, for your wife. And I said, she doesn't drink either. And just for a minute, I thought, or does she? <laughs> no, she's, she's coming back in two days. If she finds out, oh, no. Who it <laughs> but, but I said, she doesn't drink either. And, and he said, oh, he, okay. And, and I realized that this could dampen our friendship, but I also knew that if I didn't say something now, somewhere in there, he might show up with cases of beer saying, hey, and if I say, then he's going to say, what do you mean? I gave you what? You see what I mean? You, 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 I say, to, 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 who, to whom are you listening to? You better be careful before you make, this man here, he was, a, he, there's no doubt he was a good man. He was the king. There's some good people come to him, and he listened to the wrong voices. This man here, he was a good man. He, listened, he didn't listen to good voices. He should have. He should have. Uh, who are you listening to? Let's, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good to us. Lord, thank you for uh, th these illustrations, true, true events that took place. One man had something good coming to him, and he listened to the wrong voices. Another man had something bad to him, and he didn't listen to the good voices. Father, there's a, there's a competition to get our attention, to direct us, to guide us, and Lord, Lord, help us to make the right decisions, listen to the right voices. Um, uh, with, uh, pray you bless the invitation now, in Jesus' name, amen.